And once again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Buffalo History Channel on the uh, premiere of a brand new series that I'm starting here on the platform called The Soul of Buffalo TV, The Series. Now, you, certainly you all remember the Buffalo History Channel original production of 2022 called The Soul of Buffalo TV, which which became very, very popular on the platform. And I decided to expand on it by talking to some of the Buffalo, some of the legendary Buffalo personalities. And this is this gentleman here that's that's joined us. This is actually our first time meeting on off camera. And uh, yeah, we're just getting acquainted. <laughs> and I can remember watching, watching this brother back in the day when he was uh, on the Channel 2 News. And one of the things about it, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm, and I, let me just introduce him. I think you because you know him today as he's part of he reports on Inside Edition. And his name is Les Trent. I'm happy to welcome Les Trent. Welcome to the Buffalo History Channel. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I love it. Absolutely, man. I was gonna tell you, gonna say that, you know, but back when I was watching you when I was back back in the day when I was a kid, I don't really want to make you feel too old. <laughs> but um one of the things about it is that particularly back in those days that like anytime I'm sure you know anytime particularly within our community in our culture anytime we see somebody on television that looks like us everything in the house stops so anytime we saw you on anytime we saw Sandy on or or Stan Coleman or John Winston everything in the we, we definitely made a made it a point to get to the television I mean certainly back in the day we all know we had Irv Weinstein and Rick right. Azar and Tom Jules, Commander Tom, as That's I affectionately right. remembered him. S certainly, much respect and a shout out to the three of those gentlemen. But it was also it was something special whenever we saw a black face on any of the three champ TV news stations two, four, and seven. Once again, especially let's because welcome to the Buffalo, especially History because Channel. it was so rare. Yes, yes, certainly at that time. So, Les, you have a pretty long history in Western New York, but I also know you're from, uh, you're originally from Canada and Fort Erie. Can you talk to that, us about your beginnings in, in Buffalo media? Sure. I mean, I was I, I was fortunate in that uh, I'm an American citizen, but I was living in Fort Erie. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up on, you know, on Buffalo television, went to college in Toronto, and I was lucky enough to get a job when I graduated college Um at uh, Buffalo radio station and at the local newspaper in Fort Erie at the same time. So I would literally drive back and forth across the border every day. Um, and I always knew I wanted to do television, but uh, I started off in radio uh, because I knew it was a great training ground. And I know right. Buffalo is such a great market. So I started, at, I believe it was WNYS. I think those were the call letters at the time, 104.1. Okay. Um, then I was lucky enough to get hired at WBLK and my job there, I mean, imagine, you know, listening to this powerhouse for, for years and getting a job there. I was in, I was in awe. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember something about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't good enough to be like a, like a, you know, a real DJ. I think I did maybe a weekend shift or something. My okay. primary job there was voicing commercials. So I would come in after hours. And uh, they had this great copywriter there named Keith Crippen. And Keith okay. would have all of these all of these commercials written, and I would voice them. And, you know, wow. I, I would have to make sure that it was 30 seconds dead on, no right. ands, ifs, or buts about it. Um, yep. And then I, so I, I learned a lot about production um, doing that. And then, like I said, I was lucky enough to get a, a few on here, air shifts here and there. Um, but then I went from there and, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these jobs too, even though they were, they were great for my beginning, beginning of my career, a lot of them were like, uh, you know, a year or two. And that's just how yeah. it works. And that's just how it works in, in, in radio, especially when you're right. first. So I left, uh, I, probably after a year, um, at WBLK and I went to this little experimental station. Um, that was run by some of the same people who worked at BLK called um, Woo Woo 107.7 W U W U. Oh, wow. A, okay. Almost like a college radio station because we played everything imaginable. And um, and then from there, I finally made a jump into something 
more in, uh, aligned with what I wanted to do. And I went over to GR55 um, and I was doing um, news over there. So that was my last radio job before I went into television. Where, and I started my television career at the WIVB, working with um, Bob Coop and Jackie Walker and uh, mm -hmm. Carol, Carol Jason and and Van Miller. <laughs> yep, we Brian, remember them all. Oh yeah, I worked with you them said all. Brian, Brian, Brian Blessing. Brian Blessing, sports guy. Yeah, yep. God rest his soul. He just passed yes, away last. Yes, year. yes. The rest guy. in peace. Um, so, so yeah, so it was, uh, these were all great training grounds for me. Um, and, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned about how your antennae go up when, whenever you see a person of color on, because it, it's so, it's so rare. And yeah. I do too remember people like, uh, Nona Barbie and Daryl Denard. And, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, of course, um, you know, Al Vodders came after me, but he's yeah. such an institution now. I, I always think of him when I think about mm -hmm. people of color in, in television in, in Buffalo. And, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to talk about how groundbreaking um, something like, uh, you know, I don't know if you, you know this or not, but, but uh, I anchored on the weekend for a hot minute at Channel 2 with Beverly Armstrong first. Mm -hmm. We were the first Black anchor team in Buffalo. And then she left, and I was there much longer with Sandy White. So right. um, a lot of times, the Buffalo News will write something about us being the first Black anchor team. It was actually Beverly Armstrong at first. Um, and then Sandy and I, um, for, the, for the longest time after that, and um and you know it, it was it was a great opportunity for both of us uh, unfortunately i think we both knew that we were probably going to be relegated to the weekends and, and i don't know what it is about the buffalo market in particular but it was very difficult i mean you have to go back in the history right. pretty far to find a, a black main anchor in buffalo um, they had one at Channel 2. Uh, he was there just when I started, and I don't remember his name. Um, but your listeners might remember he had a okay. little tuft of white hair right in the very front. Oh, you're talking about uh, Bob Gist. Yes. Yep. Yes. So he was there when I first started. And I had been there a few years anchoring the weekend when I got a call from someone named Gene Hill. <laughs> who we yes. all know mm -hmm. and she had she had been given my number by her agent and she called and said uh, hey uh, i've got this job opportunity at um, channel seven in buffalo should i take it and what i said to her was well it's a it's a great station so they're number one in the ratings they have been forever and they probably always will be i said but if you take the job as a weekend anchor I'm afraid you're probably going to leave as a weekend anchor. And um, and that was indeed the case. And so there was a certain there was a certain frustration for those of us in the business there that um, you know we were we were constantly relegated to to the weekend shows. I actually tried to come back to Buffalo even after I worked on national shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had an interview, I had interviews with the station manager at at Channel Seven, who at the time was was uh, um, was a black guy, it was owned by a black um, right uh, granite, I believe. Yes, right. yes. Um, but a ransom. I, I, I still didn't get hired. Wow. So it's a it's a tough market for for people of color, and there's such talent. Yes, I it see. is. <laughs> yeah, the talent I see that comes and goes from Buffalo, um, and it's always it's usually leaving out of just just a frustration that you know you're not going to to go very far and i know that you know a lot of people people don't want to hear that because you know you think of this city of good neighbors um, right. and, but the truth of the matter is and i think we saw it with um you know we we we, we got a really vivid and sad indication of just 
how segregated things are when we saw what happened at the tops market and the fact oh, that yeah. that this gunman knew that that there were so few places where people of color shop because of this whole food desert thing because of the fact that there are no major grocery stores other than tops on in east buffalo um so that really is just a vivid a vivid um picture of the state of things in that city and 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 um i i know that i i, I know the mayor is is doing all that he can um to 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 lift up the east side and um but you know there's there is still a certain power structure there that that just um makes it problematic for those of us who who really wanted to make buffalo our home in yeah. this career that's the that's that's definitely relatable because i mean i was in the buffalo market working both mo mostly behind the scenes but there, there were times that i was in front in front of the camera and even on the mic and yeah i mean the, i just look back on some of the struggles that i went through over almost 25 years of right. being in that market and the fact that i've lasted that long sometimes is is amazing but it, it, eventually it happens with a lot of people particularly even in my own my own generation i'm living out here in uh the dmv uh dc uh maryland virginia area and i'm I've, right I, I, the people i've connected with around my age we had a, there was a point where many of us between between like the 90s and early 2000s and they weren't all in media they they were in different professions and they all like left out of buffalo in droves so i can yeah. so yeah i can and i stayed there way longer than i thought i would have stayed but yeah that's definitely a re relatable point yeah and i think unfortunately I, I think it's probably still kind of a hmm, i think it's probably still problematic um it is. <laughs> I, know, I know Liz Lewin, who who just yeah. who just left for uh, Detroit, and um, I can't speak for her, but I'm I'm sure she would have stayed had had the job been right. Right. So it's right. it's sad to lose great talent. Yeah. I, and I I don't know what the what the answer is because again, yeah. you know the, this this existed even when there was a a, a black owned um, um, media yeah. company there. And, and and you know made I think, no made no difference <laughs> no it doesn't make any difference and i think what happens is you know it's it's similar to what happened when i moved to san francisco um i was anchoring the weekends in buffalo mm -hmm. and i was offered a job in san francisco and i ran the the oakland bureau of of kpix and um i knew that once i left that anchor desk that I would never, I'd probably never, ever get that opportunity again. And that's because the station managers, they see you in a certain, they see you as a certain, they see you in a certain light, depending on how you came in. So if you came in as a reporter, you're going to be, your, you're going to be a reporter. Yep. You come in as a weekend anchor, especially if you're a person of color, it's, it's a little bit difficult to be, to get that promotion to the weeknight anchor desk. Pigeonhole you. What's that? They pigeonhole you. Basically. Yes, they do. They, yes, you're pigeonholed. And so, when you look at the, the fact that that most of the hires for people of color are those secondary roles, then you see how difficult it is to make it to the you know to the anchor desk, to the big seat, to or or the sports or um, or the weather person. Um, these are these are really coveted positions that you know also people don't want to give up so you have anchors who have been there for 30 years and i don't begrudge them anything but again those opportunities were never ever given to us yeah okay so um any when you are you're at channel two are there any uh memorable memorable stories that that come to mind that you may have anchored told or reported on or anybody mm. connected with in chat channel too? 
Channel Two. Let's see. I did I did a lot of Channel Two. I just don't, you know, it's yeah. That's it's been what a I while. Did. That's what I did last week. I don't remember. Uh, but, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but that long ago, um, oh gosh, there were just there were any number of stories. You caught me off guard there. See, I remember this. I remember the stories that were just unusual, like right, like um, like the barge that 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 uh, ended up stuck in the Peace Bridge. Um, okay. So there was there were things like that, and and I did cover my share of storms. Um, I I, I wasn't there for these for the blizzard of seventy seven, right? But there was a an equally bad blizzard in the early eighties, and I was driving to work. Are you talking about a eighty five or um, eighty three? No, it must have been it had to be before that, like eighty two. Eighty two, okay. Because because uh, Jimmy Griffin was still mayor. That's the that, one where he talked with. I remember the one he yeah. told everybody go get a six pack. Go get a six wow. pack. That was that was. The so I was driving to work. <laughs> I remember that very well. Yes, and we all do. I didn't have a six pack at the time. I had an Atari. <laughs> I was wasn't old enough for a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was driving to work for my weekend anchor shift, and uh, I was on the uh, I was on the highway. What is one ninety? I'm having a mental block. 190 what? One, one, nine, 198. 198? Mm -hmm. oh. What is, what is, what is the one, highway that takes you to the Peace Bridge? Um, uh, oh, gosh. That's it, terrible. Even I'm drawing the blank. All those years I was yeah, there. Should be the, uh, should be the, the throughway or sort of you know, know, the one ninety. I mean, see, this I'm is what happens. See, this, see, folks, this is what happens when you leave. Oh, man, oh, this is what happens when you get old. What are you talking about? Leave that too. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I was on the highway coming to work, right? And I get broadsided by a Volvo, and the, the, it's a storm like you could you could barely see your hand in front of your face, mm -hmm. and my car was inoperable, so. Wow. A taxi cab happened to be coming up behind me, so I jumped in the cab, got to the office, came back to my car with my camera crew, shot a stand up there talking about how bad <laughs> things are out here, including mm -hmm. you know me trying to get to work, and and I just remember those 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 type of stories, those extremes, um, you know, those extreme weather stories, and and, and you know I. There are a million other stories that I that I shot there. I just can't remember. But right. what, what I will say this, the same thing I said when I ended up in San Francisco, is that Buffalo was such a great news town, and it taught me, it taught me so much that when I got to San Francisco at the time, San Francisco was the number five market. Buffalo was probably thirty three or something like that at the time, and I just remember saying, "Wow, we." we were so much more aggressive about covering the news than they mm -hmm. are in San Francisco, a much bigger market. Um, because we, we really, Buffalo to this day mm -hmm. is a great news town and it's a great training ground for journalists. And, and, um, and it really was for me, just a, a, an amazing place. I, I work with some top notch cameramen. Some of them are still at channel two and channel four after all these years. And uh, yeah, it's a great news town. I'm not sure things have changed all that much, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, back then, we, you know, when you talked about how, when you saw a person of color, you're like, oh my God, look at this. Uh, and to this day, if you look at at some of the some of the national shows. Right. You know, okay. Well, there's the black person there. It's a little bit better. Yeah. It's a little bit better than networks. You do see the right. you do see the networks, and even ET has as an all black camera. I mean, an all black um, anchor team. And if you think about what ET was like in the very beginning, yeah, with Mary Hart and John Pesh, yep. it was a very homogenized kind of show. Um, so you know, things are changing in, in certain certain places, especially in the entertainment world. Um, and and also, I think when you look at the morning news shows, they're also mm -hmm. have more diversity than than they did back in the day. So, so you you've had you've you've worked both in locally in Buffalo and of course across the country and uh, 
in, in California. What, mm -hmm. what are the differences that you find between local tele, working in local TV news and, and, and syndication? Well, I will say that today the difference isn't isn't as great as it used to be. Mm -hmm. When I first started in syndication, you know, I went from telling a minute and a half stories in local news to, in, you know, that you would shoot in an hour or two to being on the road for four days at a time to shoot one story. And back then you'd come back with reams of tapes and, you know, instead of what I used to do in local news where I would sit down and log all of these tapes, we actually had a library and you would bring your tapes to the library and they would log everything. Yep. So they would, they would say, I've done they, that <laughs> yep, a shot, shot of man walking down the street. And then they would, yep. and then they, would they would log all the interview. So, you know, when you sat down to write, you, you'd have at least something to look at to give you an idea. And then, and then after you'd looked at your, at, at the transcript, then you can go look at the tape, then you write your story. So all of that process mm -hmm. that normally you would do in a very short amount of time in local news, it could take you a, a week or longer to shoot the story, log your tapes, write your story, go through the editing process, go through revisions and then edit again. Mm -hmm. You know, you sit in the edit room. I'd be sitting in the edit room sometimes till two o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they come in in the morning. They come in in the morning and have it all changed. <laughs> so you mean, you, you mean you didn't get a chance to work with the sixteen millimeter film? <laughs> oh gosh, no, I, mean, I didn't do that. Escape that, that one. Huh? <laughs> that was slightly before my time. Yeah. But I did. I you know I did work with. Um, we did work with the big, the big tapes. I, I forgot what they were called, but there were these big tapes that we that we used to edit off of. Um, three, uh, and you mean the big uh, reel to reel or the three quarter inch? No, it's three quarter. Three quarter, three quarter. Yeah. yeah. Umatic. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my. Yeah, I remember yeah, those. Doing, yeah, I do documentary work now, and I'm, I find myself working with between the 16 millimeter films and the, and, and the Umatic tapes and trying, man, trying to find when I'm doing this stuff with the Afro Central segments. Trying to let me. I'm trying. I was online on eBay trying to find um, a three quarter inch player. Right. The money that they want for that stuff now. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's hard. If you're hard pressed to find it's find hard one. To find. Yeah. yeah. Fine. But but that stuff is needed because there's yeah. so much great archival footage on on those formats. Right. Right. Yeah, never, never throw anything away. I'm glad mm -hmm. to have found some of those tapes. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I can remember when I did my stint in TV news and journalism, uh, one of the things that I had to learn, because I came from working independently when I was doing some still my own stuff with documentaries and everything, and I did a lot of my work was in long form. Mm -hmm. But when I get into news, I, I had to transition into mm. short form stuff. So... And it can be hard to kind of go go that way. So what, what, yes. what do you think? What do you think? To, so as someone who's worked in news mostly, right, done mostly short form stories. What is, what is the difference? Do you think between short form stories versus long form? Well, you know, when you're doing a long form story, it's almost like um, I used to. Even when I was writing for news back in in Buffalo, I had this cameraman who used to joke that you know, my typical story started something like, it was a sunny day because I always wanted to set the scene. Storytelling. <laughs> yeah, one of, the, one of the biggest differences in the, in the long and the short form story is that, is that you, you were doing storytelling. You're setting up the scene. Um, and then when you, when, you have to, when you have to transition to just telling the, the news straight and in a shorter format, you take, out all the, you take out all the flowery stuff. You take out all of the, not all of it. You got. You have to have some of that stuff in there, but you do take out a lot of the the color, if you will. And one thing I say about Inside Edition, first of all, I work with um, I work with people in management, in the editorial management, mm -hmm. whom I've worked with for since I started. So I was working with for American Journal for five years. That was produced by the same people who produced Inside Edition. So five years there and now 22 years at Inside Edition. So almost 30 years I've been working with 
uh, these folks who really know how to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we have perfected, and I, and I still don't know how we do it, but you might see a story on Inside Edition that is a minute and 15 seconds long. Mm -hmm. And you will swear that you saw a whole news magazine style story that you might see um, in, in the same vein as a 60 minutes. But we've learned how to, how to, how to make it into a news magazine story in a very short amount of time. And there's a certain something to it. I don't know what it is, but if you look at the exact same story that we do and you look at it on the evening news or on the local news, somehow our story will seem like, um, you're like, oh, I, did, I didn't know that. And maybe that's part of it is that, is that we'll always look for the, the other angle to give, it, to give that story something different. Right. Um, and I think that's what, that's what really makes a, when you have to bring things down to, to a shorter amount of time, and the only reason we do that now is because people have a short attention span. So no yeah. one's going to watch the story. We used to write stories that were six, seven, eight minutes long. You know, the show would have three or four stories in the entire show. Right. Now we have 20 stories in a show. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, not 20, maybe 15. But the point is we've had to perfect the, uh, the short storytelling into a news magazine format and it it's it's um it, it's it's kind of brilliant i'm not crediting myself i'm saying the people i work with and how they've mm -hmm. managed to right to continue yeah. to tell these stories in that that short amount of time and still make it seem like it's a it's a fully flushed out uh, news magazine story it's just it's just an art yeah, that, that whole short, the short attention span thing, you know, getting in as a content creator on social media and YouTube, uh, that's something that I've had to kind of <laughs> wrap my head around too, because, you know, I'm coming out of, out of the industry, you know, you're so used to putting, putting, editing things together and visualizing right. it with B-roll and everything. Right. Now, you can go on, go, because you're trying to keep people's attention for a short period of time. But but then I look at some stuff on YouTube. I consume a lot of the content that I consume on YouTube. I'll see somebody do a podcast on, they'll do like a two to three hour podcast behind right. that avatar. Right. And they get all kinds, <laughs> they get hundreds of thousands of people watching. So you, the whole, like, wait a minute. I know. Happened? So that's something it's still something I'm trying to kind of learn my way around. Yeah. I'm trying, you try to take something that you learned in the industry, then you, then you, but at the same time, you kind of have to like re also learn a new way of doing things on right. social media. So it's kind of, it's a strange kind of an animal, but I'm it, still, you know, you're absolutely right. And I, I never, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. There, there are things, there, there's certain content out there that those of us who are old school and all right. the category even though you're younger than i am yeah those of us who are old school look at it and go how is this getting yeah. this much traffic just one because shot for two mm -hmm. hours and people are people are still watching and, and subscribing and everything they're making money off of it and everything <laughs> i know it defies logic it really yeah. does it's amazing so, so I know you've worked on, um, you transitioned into the California market and you've mentioned American Journal Extra and Inside Edition. So how did, how did that transition, how did, how did that opportunity come about? Even though we, we all pretty much know you on Inside Edition now. Well, what happened is um, uh, when I was, when I was in San Francisco, um, I, I actually got a call out of the blue. <laughs> I had an agent at the time. Time, but it wasn't I didn't get okay. this from my agent yeah. I got a call and it was one of the it was one of the um co-creators of this new show called American Journal okay and American Journal was really like I said it was a sister show to Inside Edition um our show was was deemed as the as the um the more serious if you will our stories were actually longer than Inside Edition which is amazing back then like probably seven eight minutes long and um 
and they were be, they were starting this new show, American Journal, and I I got a call out of the blue. Someone had seen me on the air or something, and they said, uh, "Hey, would you come work for us?" And I'm like, uh, "Maybe." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, because I was going from a solid news station in San Francisco to something that that was not only it was a bit of an unknown entity, right? But it was also a sister show to Inside Edition, which was considered at the time tabloid. It was the you know it was competing against um, shows like A Current Affair um, and Hard Copy. Um, ours was ne- our show was never that extreme, but we were lumped in that same category. And so I had some reservations about leaving hard news in San Francisco and going to a news magazine show that actually wasn't even on the air yet. Hadn't uh, established but, itself, basically. Yeah. So I'm yeah. So I, but I took the gamble. I, and I and I took the leap, and I have no regrets about it. I I moved from San Francisco to New York, and. Um, I've been working in New York ever since, but I also, um, I lived in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Um, my then wife and I lived in San, lived in New York City for just uh, probably less than a year. Mm-hmm. And I was traveling all the time. So we said, you know, why don't we move to Buffalo? At least her family was there. So we moved to the Buffalo waterfront close to her, close to her parents. Um, and then uh, my daughter was born in Buffalo. My son was born in Oakland, California. And f- and from there, we moved to Orchard Park for the schools. Um, and I would come, I would drive, I would, first I was flying for the first couple of years. And when, when American Journal was on, they flew me back and forth. But then when American Journal was canceled and I went to Extra, I was forced to drive. So I would drive every single weekend from new york northern new jersey actually uh to buffalo i I did it through rain and snow and sleet and all kinds of craziness but i went i ended up going through like three volkswagens (laughs) you know they all they died about 200 250,000 miles um it was a labor of love though and i you know so yeah i did that for for many many years the things we do for our profession, particularly yeah. in this business. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Any of uh, I know I asked you this about uh, Channel Two, and let me ask you this about Inside Edition. Any of uh, stories that stick out to you for Inside Edition? Now, I was going to also ask you because I, I, I did hear that you had a, a a lot of people I talked to. They they all everybody's the people that I've talked to. They always have a story. Have these strange how they always have a story about interviewing or interacting with Michael Jackson. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I have one of those. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's start with the Michael Jackson story. (laughs) Okay. Michael Jackson. So I was, uh, I was actually shooting a story. Robert Redford was doing something in Oklahoma and and I was shooting this or Omaha Mm -hmm. and I was shooting this, this thing, this event. And I get a phone call from my office and they're like, Hey, um, how would you like to go to uh, Bangkok, Thailand and in Auckland, New Zealand with Michael Jackson? I'm like, sure. Wow. So it, it was just one of those weird behind the scenes things where, yeah. where someone I worked with, like a, a, one of the lawyers at then King World, as it was called, um, he, you know, he, he was owed a favor or by one of Michael Jackson's lawyers. So they, they, they just worked this thing out and they said, Hey, tell you what um michael jackson's gonna be on tour you guys can tag along now they gave us rules what they said was you're going to be like part of his entourage so when he goes someplace you're going to be going with him Mm -hmm. um but he's not going to do any interviews now we didn't really care about that it's all about the it's all about the visual right so uh, so again i was working for american journal at the time the sister show inside edition um you know we worked in the same building and, and uh they decided to send a, pr- a producer from inside edition and a producer for american journal because what we we're going to do is do stories on both shows about our time with michael jackson mm. so it was um 
you know, you have to understand too, we're on the other side of the world. So we have these crazy deadlines that are like in the middle of the night. And we, we literally were in the same hotel. Um, they would say to me, um, Oh, Michael's, Michael's coming out to the balcony to, to greet his fans. And so I'm standing on the balcony with my microphone and I see him coming down on this, this glass elevator, you know, that's, op that's open to the, to the crowd. And now I'm like, I'm going to start shooting standups. And, you know, when you're doing that, you can't screw up. So, right. <laughs> I'm, shooting, so I'm shooting, I'm just talking. I don't know. Here's uh -huh. Michael Jackson. Blah, blah. And so he comes down as I'm talking, walks right by me and waves to the fans. And we're shooting the whole time. Uh, then, then we got him. Then they called us and said, Michael's going to a uh, record store. Great. So we get in the cars and we're driving down with a police escort and and uh, we're part entourage of huh? yeah we're <laughs> part of this entourage and he they closed down the record store michael's walking around and i'm and we're shooting all the video and and uh and it, it, and then you know they said no interviews but but what happened is w one day before he went on stage i believe we were we were in auckland new zealand he was doing a photo shoot beforehand with with just fans mm -hmm. behind the scenes and so he's talking to this girl, this little girl he's taking a picture with. And he goes, oh, are you shy? He says, I'm shy too. Welcome to the shy club. So <laughs> that was that was my opening to say, I, I said, yeah, Mike, you say you're shy, but you get out there on stage and oh my God. And, and he answered and uh, his press person looked at me and said, hey, hey, no interviews. And I said, I said, that wasn't an inter interview. I just asked him a question. <laughs> And you then, are not supposed to interview. Me. <laughs> Another time we were in a hospital <laughs> and he's, he's visiting these kids in the hospital. Yeah. And then uh, and we're, and we're shooting the video mm. and he looks at his camera person. He looks at my camera person. My camera person's got a boom mic up and he looks at, he looks at this guy and goes, Hey, how come we don't have a boom mic like they do? <laughs> and I said, don't worry, Michael, we'll get you any, any of this stuff we shoot, you can have. <laughs> I'm then, visualizing right, that right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then, then after that, he was standing in the hallway as his guys were getting B-roll. And uh, so I walked up to him again and started asking him questions. And, and uh, you know, so those two, those little short encounters with him, we ended up doing, I don't know, five or six stories. Wow. wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, so anything uh, like, so any memories or any memorable stories from Inside Edition? Oh gosh. Um, oh, uh, so many. That was, again, that was American Journal. Uh, oh, okay. You know, the um, the Oklahoma City bombing, I happened to have been on a plane flying somewhere for another story, and I had a connecting flight. Right. And when I landed, um, one of the red shirt, the red coat agents came to the, to the door and approached me and uh, said, um, your office called and they need you to go to Oklahoma city. Mm -hmm. What? Cause it happened when I was on the plane. So, oh, okay. so, um, so I went there um, and what's wild is I landed I landed probably noon that day or maybe even before noon. And our deadline is about three or four in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But because we're a news magazine show, we can, I can't just walk into a place like uh, in Oklahoma city and just shoot the story like the evening news would, or, or like local news would because in most markets, we come on right after local news and right before, you know, right after national news. So our stories have to be different. Right. So instead of just doing a story on, the, as I say, the hits, runs, and errors uh, of, of what happened, I need to find somebody who survived, who has a story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that takes a lot longer than just going there and just shooting video. So Oklahoma City was one of those big story 
challenges, one of my first um, in syndication, where it really took a lot of thought and effort about how what you were going to cover on this story, because it had to be different. Imagine a story that everyone in the world is covering, and you have to tell the story differently. <laughs> wow. So that's mm -hmm. so it was that same thing with 9-11. I was I was there for that. Um, that was that was just a brutal assignment. And what made the assignment even worse for us is that we put all these amazing shows together. We actually won an award for, for the shows we put together. But we were preempted most of the time because everyone was going 24-7 on, on the, the attack. So, you know, if we're on at 7 o'clock in a certain market, they're not going to cut away for Inside Edition. They, would, they were doing their own extended coverage. So a lot of our shows that we put together never saw the light of day. Mm. Um, so that was that's tough. Um, and then I covered uh, Princess Diana's funeral. Um, you know, quite emotional. Um, I covered uh, Biggie Small's funeral. Wow. That too was was something to see. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I've done almost every school shooting or I mean, all the crazy mass shootings over the past 10 15 years you know it's including including um the, the one at uva which i just got back from oh, today wow, okay yeah so those are those get harder and harder you know as you as you as yeah. you get older that's a that's a young man's um, yeah. reporting right there. I, I always especially say, with, with all those those especially with stories of that nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell I tell my my assignment desk, give that to the young kids. I've done it exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, lastly, uh, one thing that brings everything or your career full circle is you were inducted into the Buffalo Broadcast Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. Yeah, that was, what was that, that. What was that? What was that experience like? It was. Uh, it was a thrill. I didn't expect it. Um, you have to understand. I, I'd only been in Buffalo uh, media for probably three or four years before. I, was that? Was that three or four? I mean, no, I'm probably. I'm lying. Seven years. Okay. I said seven years before I left for San Francisco. Um, but I do know that the fact that I worked for national shows and that I'm always talking up Buffalo kept me on the radar of the Buffalo Broadcasters Association. And so um, they, they out of the blue contacted me and, and told me that I was going to be inducted. And I was like, wow, because there are others who have, who are, who have been there longer and are, and I'm not saying this in any sort of false modesty, but who are far more worthy <laughs> who did not get inducted for many, many years after, mm -hmm. after I did. But so it was, it was a thrill. Um, you know, I got to, I got to meet for the first time, believe it or not, I, I met uh, Irv Weinstein, even though the late, the late Irv, um, even though we worked in the market all those years, you know, we worked for competing stations. So I never, I never met him. And um, it also, and I, 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 I failed to mention this too, that uh, Bob Coop, the late Bob Coop from Channel mm -hmm. Four, really was my mentor in Buffalo. Oh, um, okay. With, without him, I would never have been inducted into Buffalo Broadcast Hall of Fame. He, um, I worked when I worked at Channel Four. That was my first television job. I was a weekend producer. I eventually got on air um, as a reporter. I wasn't there very long because I then got called from Channel 2 to go over as the weekend anchor. So I wasn't on air a long time at Channel 4. But Bob just took me under his wing. He was a great guy, very smart. And he is the reason that um, he's the reason I have my children because there was I, one day I was sitting there and I, and I uh, it was after the six o'clock news. And I look over and I see this beautiful black woman with all this hair. And uh, I said to Bob, who's that? <laughs> He's like, uh, oh, 
that's my neighbor and uh it, her name's kim and and he's he's and uh kim said to him do you want to go to dinner and he goes i can't i have to write for the 11 o'clock news so i was like mm, i'll go to dinner so uh <laughs> so i i started dating this this woman she was living in paris at the time and, and coming back oh. she lives she's from east aurora mm-hmm. she lived right down the street from bob and um and so we started dating we got married and we that was my first wife and and we have two beautiful children together so whenever i saw bob after that i was like thanks man <laughs> hey <laughs> hey man you, you came through for bro came through, came through. <laughs> yeah bob was bob was a great guy absolutely man so in closing uh is there we certainly buffalo has a, a whole new younger generation they seem like they seem like they love us a lot more nowadays. That's every time I turn around, I'm seeing a black face on on Buffalo TV now. Even That's all true. The way here from the DMV, like they I see somebody else get hired or on the, on TV. I, I always say they they bought another one in. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so uh, anything that, anything that you would have to say to any young people coming up in that want to come up in the industry or coming into the industry? Well, I I always say that um, you know they're. There are a lot of naysayers out there. There are a lot of people, I'm sure you encountered them too over the years, who say, yeah. you know what? Yeah. This, this is too hard. You don't want to do this. Um, but I think if you're passionate about it and, and you know that this is this is your thing, then you just have to do it. And that's how I was from the very beginning. I just always knew that it's what I wanted to do. Um, I did have a lot of people tell me that, you know, you know, I'm never going to, do much in it because it's too hard oh um, you too huh <laughs> oh yeah yeah but i think that it had i listened had i listened i would have given it up yeah. um a long time ago but there was there was no way that i was ever going to to give it up and i just and i just kept on plugging away and that's my advice to people is that you know you gotta you gotta commit you gotta be all in and if you're all in and you're willing to do the hard work and when i say the hard work um, I, I've heard from some of the interns I work with, for instance, who will say, yeah, you know, I want to be on television, but I want to start in New York City. I'm like, wait a minute. No, <laughs> that was that was always the goal when we were coming yeah. up. It's like, yeah. I want to go to the number one market, New York. Yeah, but I've we, heard would ne- we would never have said, I want to start my career in the number one market. Um, so, so I tell people, be patient, yeah. you know, do radio. Got to. Yeah, go to go to Peoria, cover the snowstorms in Peoria. You don't have to be there long, but you're going to learn so much. You're going to learn how to shoot. You're going to learn how to edit. You're going to learn how to write. And uh, it is it's a it's the best way to go. Absolutely. And definitely learn how to write. <laughs> definitely learn how to write. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Les, it has been a pleasure and honor to have you as the first of interview of our Soul of Buffalo TV series. Well, Doug, it is my pleasure. All right, we'll be looking for you on the tube, man. <laughs> I'll, I'll be there. All right, my man. All right, go Bills. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs>